Be the Talk, episode 197, featuring Sarah Baker Andrus. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Sarah Baker Andrus. Sarah, are you ready to talk? I am excited to talk with you, Nathan. Before starting Avara Careers, a career coaching and consulting business, Sarah Baker Andres worked as vice president of marketing at Dove Chocolate Discoveries, the direct selling division of Mars Chocolate and director of external relations and academic programs for Vector Marketing, the company that sells Cutco Cutlery. Under Sarah's leadership, Vector became one of the largest private recruiters of college students in the United States. Having gotten her own professional start in career services, Sarah knows that today's careers are best described as jungle gyms, not ladders, and she loves sharing her strategies to help others achieve enduring career satisfaction, including her students at the University of Delaware, where she's an adjunct professor. Sarah Baker Andrus, welcome to the talk. Thank you so much, Nathan. I am really glad to be here. So your branded talk is called The Job Hunt is Dead. I love that you had three simple questions that are going to put people on the road to success. And I love that, you know, we heard it in the bio. It's a jungle gym. It is not a ladder anymore. And I felt like you had so much knowledge and gold and uh, external different perspective in your talk. Please take us behind the talk. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's really an interesting process when you think, and most of us know this, that we may be in a situation in a job where we're feeling as though something needs to change. In fact, the Gallup organization that surveys American workers every year tells us in its most recent polls that nearly 50 percent of all Americans are unhappy at work, Mm. which is crazy and sad because as adults, we spend most of our waking hours at work, uh, most of us more hours than we'd like to. And yet when it comes for looking for work or considering a career change, so many of us just don't know what to do, Nathan. We're sort of paralyzed. And, you know, the other piece of this is that there's so many fears around job hunting. So as soon as we get this impulse, oh, I really need to find something new. We immediately, all of a sudden, forget that we're competent professionals and we begin to question our qualifications. And we worry that maybe our skills aren't up to date or we worry we may not find anything better and perhaps we should just be grateful. Or we get scared about what a job change might mean for the people and things that matter to us. Many of us worry about the interview process. We feel like our interviewing skills are, are, are pretty stale or, you know, fundamentally what about stepping out of our comfort zone and the learning curve that's required in a new job. And what I was talking about when I said the job hunt is dead is really that the way we think we should look for work is not the way we should look for work. The way that that society and the messages we get uh, tell us to look for work is not the way we should look for work. And it's not what what's working. So all of these fears can stall us all together. But then let's say something happens and you have a really bad day at the office and you think, oh, my gosh, I, I have to get out of here. So what's the first thing any normal adult human would do in 2018 You sit down at the computer, you hop on your favorite job board, and you start looking at postings. And this is really, this kind of approach is really a recipe for disaster. I don't know how else to put it. But these job boards seduce us into believing that we're actually engaged in an active job search. But we're not. We're not actively looking. In fact, research from LinkedIn tells us that 85% of their members who switched jobs, I think it was 2016, found that they found their job through a connection or somebody they knew personally. And that's backed up by my own very unscientific research. I'm connected with a lot of senior HR professionals because of my previous work experience. And when I asked them how many applicants are coming through online job boards that you actually hire, how many of those folks, I hear 7 to 12%, which is very close to that LinkedIn number of Mm -hmm. 85%. So it's all aligned that that 
we're being falsely seduced into this idea that that we're looking. And the worst part is, Nathan, the worst part is that online job boards suck the life out of us. They are discouraging either because we are too harsh in our own judgment Mm of our qualifications or because we never hear a thing. It's just crickets. And so they're really a poor place to start a job search. And it's really one of the things that's propelled me into the work that I do is this gap between what I know works to help you find a great fit uh, in a job you're going to love and what people are doing. And it shouldn't be a secret. Well, so. and, and it's a huge gap because just like your your scenario, that's a very common scenario. I got to get out of here. Maybe there's an ethical breach. Maybe, you know, maybe there's all kinds of difficult things. Maybe you just realize that you're kind of on the way out. Maybe, may, you know, maybe changes or policies or whatever. And what it, it immediately happens, this is really about, I think it's going to be a theme of the day as I interview other people and we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence and some other things. This is really another talk about about emotional intelligence, because the first thing that happens when you feel unsafe at work, there are other people I've interviewed, they talk about that unsafe at work feeling and the lizard brain takes over its fight or flight. And then all of a sudden you're going to take that state instead of instead of reaching out to someone like like Sarah here <laughs> what do we do we don't hire the career coach instead we start <laughs> looking for another place to go and we're freaked out and we're looking around the odds are against us it's all automated it's a very low touch place yet per your talk and I don't want to um uh, delve too deeply in the talk just because Talk Universe can watch your talk. We're going to have the show notes for that. But I, I love in your talk, you give a really good example of a, of a very forward thinking dude that became a donut delivery boy for yeah. a day. He, he, you know, did all the conventional stuff. He found his top 40, you know, I think it was Bay Area tech companies he, he felt like he was a match for. And then instead of just you know, joining his his place at the end of the line. What did he do? He got some donuts and he, he went on a delivery mission. And when the HR director opened up that donut lid, it was a little note and his resume was taped inside. So, I mean, that's not so much about donuts. It's not really about gluttony. It's about having high emotional intelligence. And that means having empathy for the person that has to say no to 95-ish percent of all of these boring resumes that they've had to read. So, um, Sarah, why did you put that? When did you find out about that? Yeah. And, you know, is that a, is that something that you found on LinkedIn or, or where do you find the backstory? And what are what are your takeaways from that story? So that's a great story. And the interesting thing about that is not so much what he did. It was not so much his tactics. It was really what he did before that. Mm -hmm. So he uh, did something we can all do. And uh, this is, you know, what I tell anybody who'll talk to me, you know, my clients, my students at UD, I tell them the most important thing in your job search is not to look at what's out there, but to look at what's in here and to really know yourself and to really ask yourself, who am I? What do I want out of this thing called work? And, and what do I have to offer a prospective employer? And so he had, he had thoroughly, uh, done his research and his homework. And I heard about him because I am a absolute news junkie when it comes to my passion, which is the job search arena. So I am always looking for great stories of how people step outside their comfort zone, Mm -hmm. of how people navigate a complicated job market without, uh, what I consider really a passive waste of time of submitting applications on time. That's not to say that online job boards don't serve a purpose in a job hunt. I'm sure that this young man that I talked about used them to identify prospective employers. So I'm sure they were a piece of his puzzle, but they're really more of a resource than a conduit to a real job. Mm Mm-hmm. For example, they can tell you who's hiring, but I always think it's better to go on the company website. And there are many strategies that you can use that 
don't involve sitting at a computer. And one of the things that I feel pretty strongly about is what you and I are doing right now. You and I've met in person, which is nice and a privilege. I know that's not true of the most of the people that you that you talk to, but we are connecting. I can see you. I can hear you. We're we're having a meaningful conversation. And in my experience, it is these meaningful conversations that help us build what I'll call champions or advocates to build the professional relationships. And a lot of people are afraid of this word networking because they imagine going to an event in a room full of strangers. Mm -hmm. That is something you can do that that can be effective depending on who you are and what you're looking for. What really works instead of the standard networking uh, image most of us have of going to a big room and a lot of strangers, what really works is talking with people one on one. What that involves, though, Nathan, is having a clear, confident understanding of how to present yourself, what to say, and even more importantly, what questions to ask so that you're not looking at this conversation as, oh, Nathan, do you have a job for me? You're looking at it at building relationships with people who can be advocates for you and you can be advocates for them throughout your careers. Well, Talk Universe, it's all about adding value. It's about bringing to the table your value to serve other people. And now uh, it's actually time for us to pivot over in just a moment to serve you, Talk Universe, because I'm going to be asking Sarah some amazing questions in the Blitz Round. People ask, how could I start a seven-day-a-week podcast? It's because of what I've learned from my mentors. Some of the best mentors in history aren't around anymore. They've left hours of one-on-one -on -one mentoring behind in their books. Each month at Classics on Tap, I record a new chapter from a classic business book to help you make a difference. Download your first chapter at ClassicsOnTap.com. And we're back, and it's time for the Blitz Round with Sarah Baker Andrus. Sarah, are you ready? I am ready. So I'm going to ask you a couple of either or questions related to the preparation and performance of your recent talk. Here's Let's the first go. question. All right. Um, were you uh, selected to speak or did you apply? I was invited. Aha. Ironically, because there, there are so many parallels between uh, applying for a branded talk such as a TED Talk or something like that and finding a new job. So that uh, congratulations for being well, invited. I will tell you that it was neither ironic nor a surprise okay. because of what we just were discussing, that um, ah. it was relationships. Okay. And so you worked, you worked the system, and, and your, your system of high emotional connection, which is actually an advanced strategy that other people have, have shared here on the talk. Uh, Sarah, are you a, uh, a memorizer, an improviser, or a blender? I'm a blender. How did that work for you? I feel that it worked really well. One thing that was important to me is that I not strictly memorize because then if you forget something, you can get stuck and have that, that fatal pause. So what I, what I tried to do was commit it to my heart was to know the topic inside and out to have absolute clarity on what I wanted my key messages to be. And there were only a few so that if by chance I did get lost I still knew what I'm, my key messages wanted to be. And I was at an advantage because I do know my subject so thoroughly. Hmm. And I think that that really helped me blend it between the practice, practice, practice of memorization. And then the other thing that I think can be super helpful is to actually practice out loud. Hmm. Most people just look at their notes over and over again. I made a point to practice out loud. I found an environment that was going to be comparable to the TEDx stage. There were not lights on me, but I went to a place where there was a stage mm -hmm. and there was a room and I practiced a lot there. And I found that to be uh, great for me also in terms of um, standing on the circle you know, you really shouldn't move around a lot when you're giving a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. It's it's filmed and they want you to kind of stay within that red circle on the stage. And that was great practice. Now, uh, in addition to what you're already beginning to share, Sarah, what's a tip technique or tool that helped you? So visualization. When that morning of the talk, I found myself dealing with some nerves. 
which is not uncommon. And I decided to go to a quiet space and uh, I got there very early. So I had timed for this and I visualized success. I visualized everything in my mind going through the talk from start to finish several times. I imagined the stage. I imagined the audience and I visualized feeling comfortable. Include, you know, I actually in my body felt those positive emotions that it's going well, mm -hmm. that people are responding and that helped enormously. Good to know. Uh, what was, um, you know, this is the cut for time question, Sarah, what was the most painful part of your talk that you had to cut out? Well, thank you for asking that. It was painful. I know a lot <laughs> of people say, Oh, I, my, my, mine was fine easily under 18 minutes. <laughs> uh, I had a lot to say. And the piece that I really had wanted to say was I, I like telling stories. Maybe you can tell that from the conversation. But I had related the job search and the paralyzed feeling we can get around choice and making the wrong choice. It is not a forever decision. And what I the analogy I draw is let's say you and I are going to go out to dinner with some friends and we choose the friends and we choose the restaurant and we go to uh, the nice evening that we were hoping for, and the people weren't right. Just not our, not our, not our cup of tea. Or we go out uh, to a restaurant, and the food wasn't good, or the service wasn't good, or the atmosphere was uncomfortable. Do we decide that that's it? We're never going out to another meal again. Or do we say, well, Matt, maybe next time we'll pick some different people or perhaps we'll try a different restaurant. And really, if you have a more casual perspective about your job search, we take it so darn seriously, too, too seriously. The truth is that job hopping is no longer a stain on your resume. It's mm -hmm. expected. Mm -hmm. Now, employers want to see that you are moving, that you are learning from a variety of different environments. You can't do that if you stay in the same job for mm you know, a number of years. The biggest mistake I see people make is staying too long. Talk Universe, we've been enjoying the Blitz Round with Sarah Baker Andres. Her uh, talk is called The Job Hunt is Dead. And like she just said, it's really a process. It's an ongoing set of skills, maybe even habits, uh, I dare say. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to uh, swing back in just a moment for the final word of advice with Sarah Baker Andrus. Everyone wants to change the world, but not everyone knows the first step. Before you can change the world with your talk, it has to be selected. So grab the templates, timelines, and tools that I use to get my talk selected at bethetalk.com. And we're back with Sarah Baker Andrus. It is time for the final word of advice for Talk Universe. Sure, Nathan. One thing I did was I reached out to some of the best public speakers I know. And people are used to being up on stage. And I asked them for feedback, not on my talk, because I knew my talk. I asked them for feedback on me, on my style, on my presentation. And that was enormously helpful. Mm. Mm. Sarah Baker Andrus, thank you so much for coming on the talk today. I want to let people know where they can find you. They can go to avarahcareers.com, A-V-A-R-A-H, careers.com. And uh, you can also go on our show notes and see a link to Sarah's talk, The Job Hunt is Dead, on the show notes at bethetalk.com. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the talk and sharing your wisdom today with Talk Universe. Thank you, Nathan. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to bethetalk.com. See you tomorrow.